My name is Jackie Boutel, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar, RTI for English Language Learners, Appropriate Screening, Progress Monitoring, and Instructional Planning, on behalf of the National Center on Response to Intervention. The National Center on Response to Intervention is a technical assistance and dissemination center funded by the Office of Special Education Programs. The center's mission is to build the capacity of state education agencies, or SEAs, to assist local education agencies, LEAs, in implementing proven and promising frameworks for RTI. We're really pleased you could join us today. We'll be getting started in just a few moments, but before we hear from our presenters, we would like to review a few technical details about today's event and offer a few suggestions and guidelines. We trust that you've had success logging into the technology, but if you encounter any technical difficulties at any point during today's session, we ask that you contact the live meeting technical support staff at 1-866-493-2825. The number is posted in the Q&A window for your convenience. Please use the question and answer window throughout this session to type a question regarding technical issues or presentation content. The Q&A tab is located at the top of your screen. Dr. Julie Esparza Brown, Dr. Amanda Stanford, and Erin Lolick will pause one time during the session to read questions and provide oral answers. Please note that the webinar software only allows you to type in one question unless your previous question has already been answered. We are pleased to have our event captioned in live time by a captioner who is joining us online today. You might have noticed that a special box popped up on your screen when you first entered the session. That's where you'll be able to access the real-time captioning transcripts. We encourage you to resize the captioning window to a size that suits your needs. We will be recording this event so that it can be available online later for those who missed it today. In order to produce the best quality recording, we've muted all of the phone lines to minimize background noise. If you have a comment or question for our presenters, please use the question and answer tab. We're fortunate to have Dr. Julie Esparza Brown Dr. Amanda Sanford, and Erin Lowlett with us today. Dr. Esparza Brown, a third-generation Chicana, is an assistant professor in special education at Portland State University. Julie has worked as a bilingual school psychologist and bilingual special education teacher at all levels for 16 years. Currently, her teaching, research, and publications focus on the interface of bilingual and special education. Additionally, she consults locally and nationally on issues related to RTI and ELL students, least biased assessment of ELL students, and effective instruction for diverse learners. She's currently on the National Advisory Board for the National Center on Response to Intervention, and she's a co-author of A Cultural, Linguistic, an Ecological Framework for Response to Intervention with English Language Learners. Dr. Amanda Sanford is an Assistant Professor of Special Education at Portland State University. Previously, Amanda worked at the school, district, and state level to consult with schools on the implementation of response to intervention, research-based instruction, and the use of screening and progress monitoring to improve instructional outcomes for students. She conducts trainings on both English and Spanish language reading assessments and is co-author to two of the Spanish language literacy measures in the IDEL, Indicadores uh, Dinámicos del Éxito en la Lectura, Literacy Assessment Package. She's also co-authored Spanish language instructional templates for teaching phonemic awareness phonics, and fluency skills to students in Spanish. Dr. Sanford earned her MA in Special Education and PhD in School Psychology from the University of Oregon. Erin Lolich is the Director of the Oregon Response to Intervention Project, a partnership between the Oregon Department of Education and Tigard Tualatin School District 
That provides professional development and technical assistance to districts in building and sustaining RTI systems. Prior to her work on the ORRTI project, Erin taught special education and worked as a literacy specialist. Erin received her bachelor's in special education and elementary education from Gonzaga University and received her master's in educational administration from Portland State University. We're very fortunate they're sharing their expertise with us today. Thank you very much. This is Julie, and welcome to our audience. Um, we have a couple of questions that we'd like to start out to get a sense of who you are out there. Um, and our first poll question asks you, please, to identify the role that you have in the schools. So we'll take a moment to let you um, vote and get a sense for who you are. Okay, so it looks like um, there's quite a few ESL bilingual teachers, that's the majority, um, and administrators, school psychologists, um, special education teachers, and uh, maybe a, a few of you general education teachers out there, welcome, happy to have you. Move on. Okay, thank you. We're going to now go to the second poll question, and that is, how would you rate your experience on the outside of it. How would you rate your experience with RTI? So we'll take a moment to let you rank your experience. All oh, pretty even, okay. Okay, good. Uh, and now we'll move on to the third poll question. Now we'd like to know what your experience is in working with ELL students. Okay, thank you. We will move on from there. That gives us a sense of who you are out there. Um, it looks like a good many of you have experience in working with ELL students, so perhaps you're logged in in the, the southern states. Uh, we're, now we're going to move to the key questions that will be the focus of the presentation today. The first thing we're going to look at is ask ourselves, who are ELL students? We know that they're not a homogenous group, and we're really going to look at the issues um, that are important to know about our students' backgrounds. We're going to look at what we need to know about their backgrounds in order to provide appropriate instruction and interventions. Um, and we're going to address the, the question that we hear very often, and that is, are, do, do we use the same progress monitoring tools with ELL students as we do with their monolingual English peers. And we'll address what are the unique considerations for those very screening and progress monitoring uh, tools and their use with ELLs. Another frequently asked question, how do we set appropriate goals for ELLs? And what is an example of the use of screening and progress monitoring tools with ELLs? Um, and we will be working through a case study towards the end of the presentation to put all of this in action. Okay. I'm going to turn it over to Erin to talk about RPI. Okay. Greetings, virtual guests. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues in Tiger Tualatin. I think a few of them are listening in this morning, and I just want to acknowledge that Anything I share that resonates with you this morning is the collective work of staff in Tiger Tualatin. And conversely, anything you disagree with, I would like to attribute to my colleagues as well. The National Center for Response Intervention describes RTI as an integrated system of student assessment and evidence-based instructional interventions within a multi-level prevention framework in order to maximize student achievement and reduce behavior problems. I'd like to highlight a few, a, a few key terms in there that I think stand out. 
The first is evidence-based. This is what really distinguishes response to intervention from the status quo in school districts, the use of both evidence-based assessments and curriculum. Okay. The next term I'd like to highlight is prevention. The focus of RTI is to prevent uh, further instructional problems. In Tiger Tualatin, we identify students that may need additional support as early as October of kindergarten. And last, maximizing student achievement. The focus of response intervention is to make sure that every student makes adequate growth. So we take students from where they're at and ensure that they make as much growth as they possibly can. Okay, moving on to the critical features of response to intervention. The first is the use of screening and formative assessment data to identify students at risk for reading difficulties. So to give you an example from our school district, we use both DIBBLES as a screener and then for our students in Spanish literacy, we use EDEL as our screening tool. The Macmillan Treasures program is our core reading program at the elementary level, so we would use Macmillan Treasures assessments as part of our formative data. And for Spanish literacy, we use Macmillan Tesoros. So again, we would use the assessments within that curriculum in combination with our screening tools. In order to monitor the effectiveness of instruction, we would use progress monitoring tools. Again, Dibbles and Edel have several progress monitoring tools depending on the skill and the grade level of the student. And I named Dibbles and Edel because those are the tools that I'm most familiar with and also because we're here in Oregon, so those tools are readily available. There are many validated screening and progress monitoring tools out there, both in English and in Spanish, uh, but those are just a couple that I'm focusing on today. And the third critical feature of RTI is implementation of multi-tiered evidence-based instruction matched to students' instructional needs. So we provide different levels of support to students depending on the data that we have about them and differentiate it to meet their needs. The goal is for all students to develop the skills to access general education to meet or exceed state and national benchmarks. We want every student to reach their highest potential, and when we intervene with students, our goal is to target the skills that they need that will help them better access general education. So the goal is always um, focused on general education. All right. So for those of you that were placing bets about how many triangles would be in this RTI presentation, this is our one and only. and. I think you'll find that all RTI models have some kind of pyramid of interventions, and the devil here is really in the details. So I'll talk a little bit about each level of support. The first level, or the, the green level, is the core curriculum. And by core curriculum here we mean core curriculum and instruction that all students receive. This might be in reading, or behavior, or math, or writing, or if you're really ambitious, you can take on all of those subject areas. And no matter which one we are focused on, sheltered instruction is part of the core curriculum so that English language learners have access to that core curriculum. And part of the core curriculum is also culturally relevant teaching. For ELLs, this also means English language development instruction. That's part of our foundation for all students. If a student is struggling at the strategic level, they're going to receive the core curriculum plus an evidence-based intervention. This should be roughly about 15% of your students, give or take, and one of our assumptions here is that the core curriculum is meeting the needs of all students, or about 80% of our students. And if you've already met that goal in your school district, I challenge you to disaggregate your data and look again. We want to meet at least 80% in every subgroup. Some students are going to need the core plus intensive evidence-based interventions. That should be about 5% of, of students that need a very high level of support. And there are a number of reasons that students might need that level of support. They could have mobility issues. They could be experiencing some kind of trauma and they may or may not have a disability. So some students need that 
that high level of support for a period of time. Others may need it throughout their school careers. Thank you, Erin. Um, now we're going to discuss why the movement towards response to intervention. Uh, I think the field believes that the discrepancy approach really didn't, wasn't based in research, um, and, and it didn't really help us identify um, children from subgroups appropriately. We know that there have been issues with disproportionate representation of minority students in special education, and that includes both under- and over-representation. And so with RTI, we're really looking at um, bottom line of equity for all students, and we have to all understand these three premises, that education is a social entitlement achieved only when we provide all of our students equitable educational opportunities and have high expectations for every single one of our students, and that we need to understand the linguistic, the cultural, as well as the experiential backgrounds of every student and then how to use this information to systematically incorporate this knowledge, which could include the use of their native language, into curriculum and instruction, um, as well as assessment. And then based on students' unique backgrounds, we plan and adapt appropriate assessment and in, in instruction. So we're really looking at, again, knowing each and every one of our students. So to know our students, we're going to look at a few factors that are important for us to, um, to investigate or to realize. And the first factor is that English language learners are truly a heterogeneous group, um, distinctly different in many ways. English language learner students in the United States currently represent about 400 languages. However, the largest ELL group are from homes where Spanish is the native language. But projections estimate that by 2050, just a few decades from now, the non-Hispanic white students will account for only 47% of the U.S. population. So obviously we are a rapidly changing uh, country uh, with rapid changes evident in our classrooms. So the second factor that we're going to discuss our students' linguistic backgrounds. Um, in 1994, Bialstock and Hakuda said, second languages develop under an extremely heterogeneous set of conditions, far more diverse than the conditions under which children learn their native languages. Uh, and that is extremely true, that there are many, many issues in looking at students' language background, including how when the second language was introduced to them, um, how far was their first language developed? Because, as the second bullet says, ELL students may not have had the opportunity to fully develop their first language before we add the second language. And unfortunately, once the addition of English happens, since that is the dominant language, then that tends to be the language students uh, and the families decide to learn, um, leaving the first language um, really attenuated. A little more about this language background. Um, it's important to understand that language, like a first language, the second language develops along a continuum. And there are five stages that are generally identified on the second language continuum, um, and they have a variety of names. So here are some of the common labels. The first stage, pre-production or entering, early production beginning, the third stage, speech immersion. So in those stages, you'll see from pre-production to where students are really just listening to the sounds of the language and beginning to produce very simple language early production, a few words, simple sentences, speech emergence where language really develops and explodes at this level. However, it's very superficial or social language. But as we get into levels four and five, intermediate fluency and advanced fluency, this is where children start developing those deeper structures of language in order to, and are developing the academic language that they need to be successful in the curriculum, in an English curriculum. Uh, the language continuum can also be thought of in two phases, uh, which is on the right-hand portion of your slide. BICS, also known as social language, 
So the first three stages, children can really develop good social language in about two or three years. However, to move forth from the third stage all the way to stage five, to that academic language may take five to nine years or even more to develop. And this is an important concept to consider that students must acquire academic English to benefit from English-only instruction. So often what we're finding is that we have really a mismatch of the expectations, the demands of the curriculum and the classroom tasks and students' current level of English language proficiency. The third factor to consider is find out something about your students' background experiences, including where they were born. It's interesting for many of us to, to learn that 52% of all ELL students are actually U.S. born, with only 11% um, being foreign born, um, and then the remainder a variety of generations. So the differences in generational language patterns have been identified by researchers, meaning that those students who are, uh, that are native uh, born, the first generation, have more language, more native language than the second generation, with those that were born in their native country generally having the best first language uh, proficiency. It's also important to learn students' economic, socioeconomic status because in 2005, Hart and Risley, through a longitudinal study, found that there were significant differences in vocabulary and language use from individuals from low SES homes um, from those in middle class homes. So many of our, our families that immigrate here do tend to fall in that lower realm of SES and therefore have those same struggles even in their first language. And then when we add a second language on that, we can understand why children um, struggle with English language. A fourth factor to, to learn is children's educational experiences. Now, we all probably have a story of our favorite student who came here from another country and within a couple of years was very fluent in English and academically successful and perhaps even excelling. And that can happen for students who have a strong background, say four to five years of formal education in their home countries and in their native language before entering an English-only environment. And the reason is these students can transfer what they've learned in their native language to aid and, and scaffold their learning in the second language. What's important to consider is that urban and rural education in other countries can be vastly different. So it's important to ascertain whether a student has been to, has had education from a rural school, which could mean an itinerant teacher who comes perhaps three days a week, to an urban system, which would be very similar to one of our schools, but they can be vastly different educational experiences. And we need to understand that a student's age alone is not a reliable indicator of their prior educational experience. For example, if a student says that they've gone um, through the fifth grade in a small village, again, that education might be vastly different from a person who comes from Mexico City um, with the first grade fifth grade education. And students with interrupted instruction, we know of many students who um, have come to us from war-torn countries who live in refugee camps for a while or for whatever reason their instruction would be interrupted, may need instruction in the foundational skills no matter their age. Um, I'm going to take a moment to address native language instruction, although I know that many of our um, states here have English-only policies, I still, we must address that. It's important to look at the research and see how that aligns with current policies. The research has consistently demonstrated that better outcomes in English happen for ELL students and are directly tied to the amount of instruction received in their native language. Um, and Dr. Goldenberg from Stanford um, writes about this in a 2008 brief where he reviewed um, all of the extant literature um, and uh, clearly found this, this pattern to be, um, 
to be clear in the literature. Um, so the longer that ELL students receive native language instruction, the better the outcomes in English, um, academic outcomes. So one reason to consider is that ELL students that get English-only instruction have a double cognitive load. So probably many of you have been um, uh, foreign exchange students in other countries and remember how challenging and taxing and tiring it can be when you're trying to learn a new language as well as learn in that new language. And you may have felt sometimes like a student that had memory problems um, and wondered what was going on with you. Um, but again, it's a double challenging load when you're needing to learn a new language and learn in that second language. We also need to look at our curriculum. RTI is predicated upon appropriate instruction for all students in the general education classroom. And I'm just not, don't expect answers, but are just going to pose these questions. Is this happening at your school? In other words, is instruction being adapted for children's acculturation and language proficiency levels? Um, and where is this happening? It would be important to see good programs that model to us what this looks like. So a critical component in this RTI system is formative assessment, and that is done through screening and progress monitoring. So let's address screening. Universal screening is conducted on a regular basis, say two to three times a year for all students. Um, generally, perhaps at report card time at the beginning of the year. And screening assessments are brief, individual, and will identify which students are struggling with core concepts. Once we've identified those students that we want to keep a closer watch on, then we progress monitor. And progress monitoring occurs more frequently than screening assessments. Um, and this could occur monthly, or progress monitoring could even be weekly, depending on the child's needs. But that the tools must be valid and reliable, and we will address this um, a bit later in the presentation. So we often get the question, should the same screening and progress monitoring assessments be used with ELL students? Well, there's two important um, points to consider, and that is the reliability and validity of the tools. The reliability asks, does this assessment produce similar scores across conditions and situations? And this tends to not be a particular problem if the tool is a well-developed tool with good psychometric properties. It will identify what the, the skill area that children are struggling um, is. But the issue may be more of validity. Does the test measure what you want it to assess? This may be a problem in assessing ELL students because our results certainly could be influenced and confounded by students' language backgrounds, their first and second language proficiency, their cultural backgrounds, as well as experiential, including educational backgrounds. So this is Amanda speaking now, and I'll talk about the screening and progress monitoring within a problem-solving approach. And one of the keys as far as thinking about utilizing screening and progress monitoring data is that we make sure to use it within a decision-making framework. If we collect data that we don't use, we end up wasting a lot of time and not getting the value out of that data. So as we talk about a decision-making framework for, um, for collecting data, we're going to talk about four different steps of, of the problem-solving approach. Um, first is defining the problem, making sure we understand what the problem is. Second step is analyzing the problem. What are the instructional factors and student factors that may be influencing the student's performance? Third is developing a plan based on that data and our knowledge of the students. And fourth is evaluating and coming back to and continually asking, is the plan working? Is instruction effective at getting students to uh, meaningful goals? We also want to talk about some of the unique considerations for screening English language learners. At, um, the same critical components that apply to all students are going to apply to ELLs, and so are some additional uh, special considerations. 
First, we want to make sure to use tools with demonstrative reliability and validity to identify and monitor students' need for instructional support in both languages, um, both their native language and in English. So, uh, Julie hit upon the importance of really making sure that we're checking the validity of the tools because validity is going to have to do with the extent to which we're actually evaluating what we think we're evaluating. For example, if we're assessing students' reading skills, we want to make sure that we're actually assessing reading skills and not their language skills. Second, we want to assess students' language skills in both L1, their native language, and L2 in English to make sure that we're providing appropriate contextual support for their uh, reading instruction. And third, we want to plan instruction based on what we know about the student's performance, both their literacy and language experiences. And the, one of the reasons assessing them in their native language is so important is that we may be able to teach students to transfer those skills, which could be more efficient than teaching them from the ground up in English only. I also want to talk about some of the unique considerations for progress monitoring English language learners. First, we want to monitor students' progress in all languages of instruction. For example, if we were to teach a student in both Russian and in English, we would want to have a means of checking and monitoring their progress in both languages. Um, if we're teaching in English only, then we would monitor in English only. Second, we want to set rigorous goals that support students to meet grade level standards. One of the things that can have a true negative effect on English language learners is reduced expectations. And Julie talked about that critical piece that education really is a social entitlement and it's a basic right for students. And if we lower our expectations for a population of students, we run the risk of decreasing their achievement. Third, we want to evaluate growth frequently, making sure that we're increasing the intensity of instruction when growth is less than expected. So if we have students who are at risk for reading failure, we need to be implementing intensive instruction and checking frequently to make sure that they're making adequate progress. We also need to compare their growth to true peers, especially if a learning disability is suspected. If we see that a student who's an English language learner is making less progress than expected, we need to make sure that that's a, a, an issue because of a learning disability, not a language difference, if we're going to consider them for special education. So now we're going to move on to a case study example, which Julie will um, talk about Yesenia, a student um, who is receiving ELL support. Okay. Um, we want to uh, introduce you to our student, Yesenia, but first let you know that although the ELL student in this particular case study is from a Spanish-speaking home, we do understand that the ELL students that you have in your classrooms do represent multiple languages, not just Spanish-speaking students. So please use this example as a framework or, at, or to guide you through the issues to consider when an ELL student of any non-native English background struggles. So with that, here's Yesenia. Yesenia was born in the United States and is therefore a second generation Mexican American. She attended Head Start for one year where she had some instruction in Spanish. Uh, meaning that while the program was not formally a bilingual instruction, uh, instructional program, um, they did some reading, um, oral language activities, um, time together with peers in the native language, um, some initial kind of pre-literacy types of learning. And in kindergarten, she attended a bilingual kindergarten before moving to a school in first grade with an English only or an ESL pullout model, no Spanish support. And in this English-only program, she receives an ESL pull-up program for half an hour a day, four days a week. Her language proficiency scores um, indicate that she is a level three in English and Spanish. So what that means, again, is thinking back to that five-level um, continuum, she is a level three. Now, that would be assessed um, on a, a proficiency test that, um, such as the Woodcock Munoz, or the loss that are uh, frequently used language proficiency tests that assess listening, speaking, reading, and writing in order to then calculate their level of English proficiency. 
Um, she was also assessed in Spanish on the same measure uh, and found to be a level three in both. It's important to consider, however, that the scores look like she has equal proficiency in both languages, but the fact is she's likely stronger in Spanish since that's the language of the home and she's had the most input in that language, so since birth. So even though the measure makes it look like she might be a balanced bilingual, that's likely not the case. Okay. So as we consider how to use screening appropriately for English language learners, we go back to the problem solving approach and we think about how do we define the problem and we've made sure that we want to use a reliable and valid tool to assess both Yesenia's reading skills in English and in Spanish we know what she comes to school with and her language skills in English and Spanish. Then we need to analyze, does the Asenia have the adequate instruction in reading and language to be successful or do we need to provide additional support? Develop a plan and make sure to base the Asenia's plan for support on what she knows in her native language. So I'm going to unpack those screening recommendations to talk about how we approach this problem with Yesenia. So, um, Screening recommendation one, using tools with demonstrated reliability and validity to identify um, and monitor her support for instruction in reading in both L1 and L2. Since she had educational experiences in both Spanish and English, we decided to use Dibbles and Edel to monitor her progress. Both of the measures have demonstrated have been demonstrated to be reliable and valid for both English language learners and for Spanish speaking students with Edel. Um, study by Hank Sneen and colleagues um, looked at the predictive validity of nonsense word fluency, Dibble's uh, measure of phonics skills, and saw that it predicted reading comprehension later for English language learners. And the EDEL measures all have documented validity for predicting reading comprehension in Spanish. So in looking at the, her performance on the screening measures, on the following two slides we have her first grade Dibble scores and her first grade EDEL scores. Some of you may be familiar with Dibbles and EDEL, so these scores may mean more to you, but I'm going to kind of summarize what the big idea behind the scores are as we look at them. Uh, we gave three measures, letter naming fluency, uh, which is a measure of how quickly and automatically students can name the letters in English, phoneme segmentation fluency, a measure of phonemic awareness or whether Yesenia can identify the sounds in words, and nonsense word fluency, which is a measure of whether Yesenia can identify the letter sounds and blend them to make words. Yesenia's scores indicated that she was some risk in emerging on letter naming fluency and phoneme segmentation fluency and that she was at risk on nonsense word fluency. If Yesenia was an English-only student, this would be an indication that she should probably receive some strategic instructional support in order to support her to reach the middle of the year goal of 50 sounds per minute on nonsense word fluency um, or for her to sufficiently develop her phonics skills. We also, though, need to look at her performance in Spanish. So as we look at her performance on the first grade EDEL measures, we see that Yesenia performed in the low risk range on fluidez en nombrar letras, which is a letter naming measure in Spanish. She is established in fluidez en la segmentación de fonemas, which is the phonemic awareness measure in Spanish. And she's at low risk on fluidez en las palabras sin sentido, the phonics measure in Spanish. So we see that she actually has relatively well established skills as far as her Spanish skills go. So we may make a different instructional decision because we know she's stronger in her native language. So we'll keep that in mind as we move on to um, considering instruction. The second screening recommendation is to assess students' language in L1 and L2 to make sure that we provide appropriate contextual support as far as language goes. So like Julie mentioned on the Woodcock Munoz language survey, Yesenia scored a level three in English and Spanish, indicating that she's emerging and may have some of those basic inter, um, interpersonal communication skills, but hasn't yet developed that cognitive and academic language. So um, she's likely stronger in Spanish because that's her home language. 
but she does qualify for and should receive support from Title III, um, either ESL support or English language development support that is going to support her to develop her native language. And as Erin talked about, it's so critical that that's seen as a part of her core curriculum, not as a part of, um, not as a part of intervention programs. The third screening recommendation, now we want to plan instruction based on what we know about the student's performance and literacy experiences in L1 and L2 and teach for transfer if needed. Teaching for transfer means teaching students to identify what they know in their native language and transfer those skills to English. So we want to unpack that a little bit for Yesenia. Um, since she's low risk in her reading skills in Spanish, we decided to implement the Tier 1 or core curriculum for her, making sure to provide English language development and um, to provide extra support with vocabulary and oral language instruction. Then we wanted to highlight what she knew in Spanish and teach her to transfer that to English. Um, so first, she should be taught about what's the same in English and Spanish. For example, many of the consonant sounds are going to be the same, and so we want to teach Yesenia that those are the same and that she can use what she knows in Spanish to read in English. We also will want to teach her what's different across Spanish and English. For example, the vowel sounds are different, and so we need to explicitly teach her that so she understands that when she reads in English, she'll be using different vowel sounds. We also will want to provide explicit instruction in vocabulary and language structure. One of the key pieces of this is that, um, is that we'll teach Yesenia about cognates and false cognates. For example, the, root, or the word classe um, has a similar meaning to the word class in English, um, and the word character in Spanish um, has a similar, um, similar meaning to the word character in English. We'll also want to teach her about false cognates, um, like the word lectura in Spanish, um, referencing reading, is different than the word lecture in English, which is talking about speaking. Um, she'll also benefit from um, her family being um, supported in continuing to support her native language development, because as Julie mentioned, the stronger native language development she has, um, the better success she's likely to have with her English language development. So as we think about those appropriate, um, appropriate use of progress monitoring them for ELLs in a problem-solving approach, we've gone through defining the problem and analyzing the problem. As we develop a plan, we need to make sure to monitor Yesenia in English because her instruction is going to be in English. And we need to set ambitious goals at grade level to make sure that she um, can make adequate progress and stay on track. As we evaluate her performance, we need to examine her performance and growth on both English and Spanish language measures and increase the intensity of instruction in reading and language if needed. Um, so we also want to consider a comparison to true peers if a learning disability is suspected. So I'm going to walk through what that looks like by actually kind of unpacking that in a progress monitoring example. Um, this is the problem solving model in a picture and many of you may be familiar with graphs that look at this. Along the um, x-axis we are looking at the months of the year, September um, through February. Along the y-axis we're looking at the uh, number of sounds that Yesenia read per minute on the nonsense word fluency measure. So we assume that in September we we assume that in September we gave Yesenia a um, screening measure and that she got 11 sounds per minute on the nonsense word fluency measure indicating that she's at risk. Now with any measure, these screening measures are brief and we need to make sure that this wasn't just a bad minute, we've all had bad minutes before, so we follow up with two additional assessments to make sure that this is an accurate assessment of Yesenia's skills. So on two different assessment period times, um, we assessed Yesenia and she had a score of 10 and again of 11 indicating that she is at risk. At this point we want to think about why is this happening and make a plan for instruction. So, we think about the plan and set a goal for Yesenia. For Yesenia, a middle of the year goal to be on grade level seemed reasonable, 50 sounds per minute on nonsense word fluency. So we set the goal and draw our aim line, and we're going to track Yesenia's progress to make sure that she makes adequate progress towards the goal. 
We also need to in implement good instruction. So we talked about implementing Tier 1 plus teaching for transfer um, and monitoring progress every week. So our Tier 1 plus makes sure that Yesenia is getting both good core instruction in an explicit and systematic core program and that she's getting vocabulary and oral language development in, um, to support her English language skills. We're also going to teach her to transfer those literacy skills from Spanish to English. We'll monitor her progress weekly, even though she's in core instruction, because she showed up as at risk on uh, the DIBBLES measures, and we want to make sure that this is adequate support. So as we track Yesenia's progress, we see that she's making a little bit of growth, um, making about 13 sounds per minute, then about 15 sounds, then 13, but not enough growth to meet the goal. So after a short period of time, we're going to implement a change in instruction because Yesenia isn't making adequate progress. So the team decided since she's not on track, we need to implement a research-based Tier 2 intervention and include an oral language component for ELLs. At this point, we're going to implement a more intensive intervention because Yesenia's progress has indicated that she needs more support to be successful. Then again, we'll track her progress. And this intervention for Yesenia was effective, so we decided to keep the um, intervention in place. So, uh, Quick note about um, the language of instruction that we decided to monitor student uh, Yesenia's progress. Um, because she was instructed in English only, we monitored her progress in English only. If she were in a bilingual program, we would need to monitor her progress in both English and her native language. Um, and the, she, her progress was monitored on grade level skills. So we have time for answering questions at the end. I'm going to skip forward so Julie can talk about evidence-based interventions. Thank you. So as many of you know, currently there are very few intervention programs uh, available that have included ELL students in their research. So the $50 million question is, well, what do we do? So we then, need to look to see what is effective instruction in literacy um, in terms of, and strategies for ELL students. Um, and Amanda and I have um, put together a framework that we call the PLUS model, defined on the next slide, that's to be used as an intervention framework uh, to consider where the re what the research tells us about the instruction of ELL students. We'll go back to the correct slide there, the PLUS model, and we've broken that down by here are the critical points and in interventions. Uh, as discussed earlier, we really need to look at the language demands of the curriculum, and that would mean that we then pre-teach critical vocabulary. By that, I mean not just the vocabulary of the content, um, but words that would have multiple meanings where they might get um, hung up on a word like bank. Uh, they know that they go to the ATM at the bank and get money, but what is a number bank? Um, and also they may not understand all of the teacher's instructional vocabulary, so it's very important to look carefully at our language use. And then the L in the PLUS framework. We have to provide good language modeling as well as opportunities for using academic language. So provide simple frames and opportunities for engagement with English-only peers um, and with adults. You remember that good ESL instruction includes real objects, visuals, and graphic organizers to help with that comprehension piece, as well as S, that we need to include systematic and explicit instruction in reading components and strategies. And I know that there's been um, a lot of uh, concern in classrooms that, well, reading is more than just decoding, and that is particularly true to um, really get across to ELL students that to read is to have meaning and to understand what we're reading. But students can't get to that enjoyment of literacy until they have the skills to do that. Therefore, we're not saying that a literacy block of time should all be skill development and, and explicit instruction, but that there certainly needs to be a component of that in order for students to move ahead. And the final S in our PLUS model, and yes, we cannot spell correctly, 
is the strategic use of native language. Uh, whenever possible, that, again, could be used as a bridge to help students comprehend uh, our, our, our subject matter. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of our formal presentation, and I'm going to turn it over to Erin, who has some um, uh, questions that are common questions um, that we will address, and then we'll look and open up the lines for your questions and see what we have time for. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Julie. You know, I developed several questions and responses based on questions I frequently get interacting with school districts across Oregon. However, they're not the questions that you asked of us today, and you had some excellent questions, so I want to start by addressing some of those and skip the questions that we already provided for you. First off, we have a question that uh, gives some background for us. It says, we have never had the need for ELL services at our school. We do, however, have students this year who are administered the access because there is another language spoken in the home. It showed the need for further evaluation. We have an ELL teacher in our county, but she's currently not serving these students. My question is, if the access, which I assume is an assessment, I'm not familiar with it, showed the need for further ELL evaluation services, where should these students be on the pyramid of intervention? If they're not receiving ELL services from a certified ELL teacher, what constitutes intervention, screening, and progress monitoring that can be done at the school level? So based on the information that you've provided, there's no evidence here that the students that you're referring to need intervention. We would have that information if those students were screened, just like all students in your school are screened as part of your reading program. If screening identified that there were some concerns and the team decided to intervene, that would be a different story. But um, just knowing that they may need further ELL evaluation um, would only speak to the level of, of ELD services and sheltered instruction that they need. And that's part of the core curriculum, as I talked about earlier. So I think it's easy to confuse ELL services with um, interventions. Interventions are for um, skills that haven't been met within content areas. Um, ELL services and sheltered instruction would be provided for every English language learner. Okay, next question. Okay, another question was, I would like to hear your views on the use of Wilson Reading Program being utilized as one of the key Tier 2 and Tier 3 supports for ELLs. Whenever we're making decisions about reading intervention programs, I always go to websites like the Florida Center for Reading Research or What Works Clearinghouse or one of the other um, evidence-based um, reviews of intervention programs and look at the studies. How effective were they? And the next step is to talk to folks that are already using um, those programs and gather more information. How effective are they? What are the logistics? What are the costs involved? So I'd use all of that in um, making a determination. And then finally, if you do have a um, Wilson Reading Program in place, I would look at your data. Are students making strong progress? Um, on their progress monitoring data? If so, I would use that program. If not, then I would, I would look at the fidelity of implementation and um, use your team as a resource to make some decisions about that. Um, we have another question that I'm going to read. Um, so are you going to give resources that address tools in specific languages? While we understand the need to evaluate in L1, what are the tools? Do you, have, uh, do, you, do you have examples for us? In times of limited and decreasing budgets, how is this evaluation done practically? So I'm going to start by answering the question and then let Erin and Julie chime in if they have something to add. As far as tools in many languages, um, some languages we have developed tools for, and I think Spanish being a highly common language, um, we're fortunate to have some options, but there are other languages that are quite common, for example, Russian, that the tools may be less available. So in that case, one of the things that's really important is to have collaboration, say, between the ELL teachers and the school psychologists who are knowledgeable about assessment tools and knowledgeable about ELL um, to come together to work together on evaluating student performance. 
Another tool to consider is utilizing curriculum-based measurement procedures, which have documented reliability and validity in English. You can design uh, tools using samples of reading material from a child's native language if you have those resources. Another key piece is to involve the families and talk with the families. You can talk with them about their child's reading development to try to get a sense of whether they're developing typically or whether they had reading difficulties in their native language. So those are some options for uh, children who may ha we may not have tools that are published and available. Erin um, and Julie? That's an answer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> one right here. Okay. okay. Next question is, will you please address the role of the ESL teacher in RTI? Excellent question. And this, um, this participant goes on to say, in Vermont, we have multilingual classrooms in low incident settings, and ESL is often accomplished via the pull-out model. While I have heard experts say, in relation to moving toward an RTI model, if you have a lot of ELLs, you can't afford specialists. And I've taken that to mean that someone is saying that all ESL instruction should be happening in the gen ed classroom with no outside experts such as ESL teachers. This is both puzzling and disconcerting. I, I'll start by talking a little bit about the role of ELL teachers in Tiger Tualatin School District. Our ELL teachers have several very important roles in the RTI process. And the first is that they are the primary providers of English language development instruction. And for us at the K-Pilot level, that is 30 minutes of instruction per day that they get in English language development. In addition to that, they are the experts in sheltered instruction. And so they have an important role in collaborating with our classroom teachers and providing professional development and coaching so that our classroom teachers have the expertise and the skills to shelter all of the different content areas for our English language learners. And last but not least is they play an important role as part, uh, on the RTI team. And the role they play on the RTI team is to bring all of their expertise in language development and bring that to the team in order to help make the best decisions about English language learner, learners that may be struggling within a content area. So they're going to bring the information on how a student is doing in L1 and L2. They're going to bring information about which skills transfer between languages, um, about acculturation, about the family. So they're going to bring a lot of rich information that is very important to consider along with the screening and progress monitoring data and any other data that we have on a student. I think we might have time for one more question, um, and I have one here. When would you refer a, uh, when would a referral to child study team be appropriate for an ELL learner in terms of years of language development? Um, also, how do you differentiate whether the student's difficulty is language-based versus a learning disability? Okay, well, I would respond that uh, it's important to, again, go back to that core instruction. What's happening in general education? Does the child have the opportunity to learn core instruction um, in that there's attention given to their level of language proficiency, um, their background experiences, experiences in their culture? And if then it is determined that that classroom has appropriately adapted instruction for that student, then we begin by providing tier one interventions, monitor that student's progress, and the interventions continue to include that elements of the PLUS framework, meaning within the intervention, we still use all of the strategies that are important for English language learners. We use graphic organizers, visuals, and we, are, we pay explicit attention to the language demands in the intervention, pre-teach critical vocabulary when needed, um, and if they're not making progress, then certainly move them up to tier two more intensive interventions. Every, at every tier, those interventions must continue to be linguistically appropriate, where we attend to the language needs of the student. Um, after we've determined that, again, core instruction has been appropriate, appropriate for ELL students, that both Tier 1 and Tier 2 interventions have also been appropriate for their level of language proficiency, 
Um, and perhaps we've gone through a couple of rounds of Tier 2 interventions. That could even happen more than once at Tier 1. Um, and that student is, is standing out from their true peers. And as we've identified earlier, true peers meaning students with similar immigration or, um, or generational status, language proficiency, uh, language backgrounds, educational experiences. So we're really wanting to make true comparisons. And if that student is, if their progress is slower than other students in their similar circumstance, then we might want to bump it up to take a look at what would happen with Tier 3 interventions. Um, so in terms of a referral for special education, we, we may do that at Tier 3, or we may determine that they just need a really big boost of intensive instruction at that point, so that progress monitoring piece is going to be critical there. Um, and then if it's determined that they're still not making progress, then it might really be an appropriate referral to a full evaluation. But certainly all that good data that you've collected throughout the tiers will assist the team when you go to referral. Um, and that brings us to 12 o'clock. I believe that that is the time allotted to us. Um, we want to thank you all for spending your time with us, um, and we've enjoyed the opportunity to share um, some of the work that we're doing with all of you. So goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. And, and this is the, the RTI Center again. Um, we oh, want to thank our presenters, uh, Dr. Julia Sparsa brown Dr. Amanda Sanford, and Erin Lolich for sharing their presentation today. If you'd like to print a copy of the PowerPoint slides from today's presentation, you can do so by clicking on the small printer icon at the bottom right-hand side of your screen. This will allow you to print to PDF. The slides will also be available on the National Center on Response to Interventions website. More information is available on our website at www.rti4success.org. If you have more questions about RTI for English language learners, please email them to us at rtiwebinars at AIR.org. We hope that you're going to join us for our next webinar, Scheduling for RTI at the Elementary Level, presented by Dr. Alexandria Hilt Panahan on May 25, 2010 at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We'd appreciate your feedback about today's session. Please take a few minutes to complete the webinar evaluation that you see on the screen. We really do value your feedback, and ultimately your suggestions will assist us in making decisions for our future webinars. Once again, thank you very much for participating today. Thank you very much, and ladies and gentlemen, let us conclude the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation. I